Well, howdy, y'all. How you doing? <laughs> Greetings from the state of Texas. All right, I was told this was a rambunctious bunch, and you're right. I, it's clear, Jake, I've got to fear the beard. I mean, that is just outstanding. And this is the first chapel. We call them chapels in Texas. Y'all call them convocations. Anyway, this is the first chapel I've ever been in that has had a skybox. Now, that is really impressive. I just want you to know that when they told me that last night, I said, I'm going to have to take a minute out of my time to talk about the skybox up there. My experience of skyboxes go back to 1968. That was before Liberty University was even, even existed. And I sat in a skybox at the Astrodome and watched UCLA play the University of Houston in what is probably one of the most famous college basketball games ever. And those of you who know the history of sport know that the team that won that game was not UCLA, but the University of Houston as they broke a record winning streak on behalf of UCLA. And I got to sit in a skybox and do that. So, so the skybox people, I have, a, I have a feeling in my heart for you. But I have to say, though, that as I think about skyboxes, that really there's one ultimate skybox that matters. And the ultimate skybox that matters is the skybox that comes from above. And you all have a real privilege being here at Liberty University and preparing yourselves for a lifetime of engagement. <laughs> We're not talking about just being married, all right? A lifetime of engagement representing Jesus Christ to a world that is needy. And so I want to talk about that with you today. If you brought your Bibles, turn with me to start off with to Romans chapter 1. And I want to talk about a tension that exists in representing God in the world. And that tension is this. How do you confront a culture that is so dysfunctional and so out of whack with a positive message of the gospel and yet engage the culture at the same time in such a way that the invitation of the gospel is clear. In fact, we have two images that I think oftentimes stand in conflict with one another and working out how to deal with those images and how they relate to one another is what I want to talk about. On the one side, we have the culture war. So you go out there as a champion for Christ and you're just ready to punch away, right? You know, a knockout for Jesus, boom. Or maybe you think of it as a battle, you know, pull, boom, pull, boom. I am from Texas. <laughs> On the other hand, we have an invitation that says that God reaches out to anyone who will turn to Him with the offer of forgiveness as a gift. So how do you put those two things together? Well, what I want to do is I want to look at two passages that show how the Apostle Paul puts those two things together. And what's interesting is these passages are so different in their tone and approach that liberal scholars say that the Paul who wrote Romans 1 cannot be the same person who's portrayed as speaking in Acts 17. Those, those two things can't go together. You can't put the culture war and the culture battle together with extending an invitation to the gospel. One or the other will win out. It can't work. And I want to examine how it can. So let's start off in Romans chapter 1. When I read Romans chapter 1, I go, Paul doesn't just live in the first century. He lives in our world. I'm not going to expound this passage. I'm just going to read it. I'll make one comment at the end. That's it. But I just want you to listen to Paul's portrait of first century culture and then reflect on how little things have changed. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, Romans 1.18. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature. Who can't walk outside today, see the blue sky and go, 
Isn't God amazing? have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. By the way, wasn't that a terrific set of amens we got during the worship? Wasn't that absolutely fantastic? That was a great job. For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men, receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And then there's this list. This is where I want to focus. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. We read through Romans 1 and we go, Paul knows the world, not only that he lived in, but the world that we live in. The more things change, the more they stay the same when it comes to the human heart. And what's interesting about this passage is is that oftentimes this passage is used in a culture war to fight a battle that's important about purity and sexuality, and we zero in on the verses that I just left the earlier verses before the list, the verses in 26 and following that talks about the debased condition of the culture that Paul lives in that is reflected in our own culture. And unfortunately, in the midst of that, we forget the rest of the passage. The list, starting with unrighteousness and running all the way down to ruthless in verse 31. And then verse 32 says this, Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things, that's plural, deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. What Paul is doing at the end of Romans 1 is not only challenging the culture, not only is engaged in the cultural battle for truth in the midst of of the presence of God and people turning their back on God, but he's reminding us of one very profound truth, and that is at one time or another we've all turned our backs on God. No one is without exception. You read through that list in verses 29 to 31, and we all fall short. In fact, in chapter 3, Paul's going to say it this way, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's why the invitation of the gospel is so marvelous, because the invitation of the gospel is to anyone and it is to everyone who has a need, and there is no one who is alone in that need for God. Everyone in this room has had and has that need for God. Everyone outside this room is alone and has that need for God. We are all in the same theological boat so to speak. And we see Paul being very direct, very frontal. He's writing to the church. He's telling the church exactly what he thinks of the culture. And Paul can summarize the culture in one theologically loaded word. Yuck. I often tease my academic dean that we ought to have a course in Yuckology 101, the study of yuck. And it wouldn't be a very difficult course to organize because all we'd have to do is look around at what's going on around us. And it's a mess. And Paul's honest about that. And the world is a real problem. So Paul in Romans 1 has his dukes up. 
and he's challenging the culture. But what's very interesting is that when Paul goes out to engage the culture, the question is, how does he do it? And this is where I want to spend the bulk of my time. Turn with me now to Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, Paul is in Athens. He is in what in effect is the intellectual capital of the Roman Empire. Everything that Rome represents in terms of Hellenism is represented by Athens. If you go to Athens today, the Parthenon sits on the top of a hill dominating like a skybox over the city of Athens. And it looks over this whole range of what was the capital of Greece, and it was the place where Plato and Aristotle and Socrates walked. And it exercised a huge cultural influence over the Roman Empire. It was the center of the intellectual world. It was like going to Oxford or Cambridge or Yale or Harvard to seeing what the world was about. And Paul found himself in the midst of Athens. In verse 16 it says, Now Paul was waiting for them in Athens. His spirit was provoked within him when he saw the city was full of idols. If you go to Athens today and you walk down at the base of where the Parthenon sits, all around you will see all kinds of statues. There's a museum that you can walk through that has idol after idol staring you in the face. The, the array of gods that were worshipped at the time. And it says, Paul was provoked. This is a nice way of saying he was not happy when he saw the idols. So we know his mindset is very similar to the mindset he has when he wrote the church in Romans in Romans 1. That's important because of what we're going to see. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons in the marketplace every day, those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? The word babbler here in Greek actually means seed picker. It's someone who goes along and, and nips at ideas, doesn't have any substance. You know, it's one of those uh, uh, a mile wide and an inch deep kind of claims. This is not a endorsement of Paul. We welcome Paul to Mars Hill to speak to us, the great apostle of the newly emerging church. That's not the introduction he was getting. Paul, come talk to us. We're curious about what you have to say as a little seed picker. Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus, that's Mars Hill, right underneath the Parthathon, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. I call this the TMZ verse of the New Testament. This is the verse that tells us that people just like to hear what the latest thing is, what the latest celebrity is, what the latest idea is. And this place in Mars here will bring anyone and everyone to come here. And sometimes they were brought out of interest and respect, and sometimes they were brought out of raw curiosity. And that's why Paul is here. People are curious about what he says, but they do not take him seriously. Yet Paul addresses them. Now we've read the Paul of Romans 1, and we know that he is provoked by the idols that he sees. Let's look and see how he begins this speech. How would you begin a speech in the midst of that environment? What if you were a gladiator in the midst of lions? A champion in the midst of doubters? How would you go about making this address? So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, and this verse simply blows me away. Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. What? I'll read that again. Men of Athens, I perceive that in any, every way you are very religious. Paul? 
Did you smoke something on the way to the Areopagus? Is that the same guy I just read about in Romans 1? How in heaven's name could you possibly commend the Athenians for being religious? Here's what Paul is doing. Paul is walking into an arena of discussion about spiritual realities, recognizing they are spiritually engaged and curious, and so he's going to respect that, even as he's going to correct that. He's going to address them with a tone of respect for their openness in the hopes that he can draw them into a conversation that they probably are not anticipating. And so he says, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. You know what the irony is? In the ancient world, Christians were called atheists. Now I'm here to inform you today that every one of you in this room, if you had lived in Rome in the first century, you would have been labeled not a theist, not a Christian, but an atheist. How'd that work? Well, the way that worked was that in the ancient world, there were, as we've already seen, an array of gods. You could pick your god, Jupiter, Athena, Minerva, Mercury, Apollos. You had a choice. There were an array of gods out there, and Christians and Jews only believed in one god. So they were atheists. Another interesting feature of ancient Roman and Greco-Roman life was the calendar. Every year there were 150 religious holidays. That means there was a holiday to celebrate some aspect of the divine pantheon every three days. We should adopt that calendar. Imagine a holiday every three days. You know, I, we should announce that, don't you think? Religious activity of all sorts surrounded people. By the way, that's one of the ways in which the world is different from the ancient world. Today we have a world full of people, some of whom think that any aspect of religion, no matter what form or shape it takes, is a waste of time and not worth considering. So Paul speaks in the midst of this with the view that he is an atheist. He does not respect the array of gods that are out there. And so they call him an atheist, and they call all Christians and all Jews atheists for that reason. Verse 23, for I passed along and observed the objects of your worship. I found also an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Having opened with respect, with a tone of respect for the fact that they are on spiritual ground talking about spiritual things, what Paul now does is to engage in a kind of subversive challenge. Notice the word I used, a subversive challenge that's going to fill in the gaps in the culture's knowledge. That's what you're here being equipped to do. You're here being equipped to understand your walk with God with such depth and with such facility that in the midst of a conversation about everyday life, no matter what form or in what direction it goes, you can fill in the gaps about where God is. And people have gaps in their knowledge of God that need to be filled in. Look at how Paul does this. What you therefore worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him, yet he actually is not far from each one of us. 
Here's a question to ponder. If someone's never darkened the door of a church, if someone doesn't know one whit of theology, they don't know the book of Genesis from the book of Revelation, they don't know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John are the four Gospels, they've never heard of Acts, they don't know what the book of Romans is, how in the world do you talk to them about God? That's Paul's audience. And he starts in the place where all theology starts. God is the creator. We are the creatures. We are accountable to the creator. And more importantly, we are designed to know the creator and to get to know the creator and to respond to the creator. If a creator exists and we are his creatures, the most basic relationship on earth, bar none, you don't need a Bible for this, you just need to think theologically. The one relationship that matters, bar none, is my relationship to that creator. That's where Paul starts. Verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. Even as some of your own prophets, poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. There is a sense in which every single person crawling on this planet is a child of God. Every person is made in his image. Every person is due a level of respect. Every person is called to know the living God because in one sense we all are his children. Remember at the end of Romans 1 I said we're all in the same theological boat? We all need God. Well there's another sense in which we're all in the same theological boat and that's we are all children of God. You see, one of the dangers of the culture wars and what they have produced is an us and a them mentality. There's us, the Christians. I'll be back. Okay? Representing God, standing in the white trunks, in the red corner, the Christians. And then there's the bad guys, dressed in black, the other, on the side of Satan and the demons in a spiritual battle. And what we do is we create this divide. But the gospel, even though it's in the midst of a battle, is not ultimately about the battle. The gospel ultimately is about an invitation that says we all are children of God, we're all made in His image, we're all designed for relationship with Him. And yet we all in our own strength fail God. And so the Christian is extending a hand of invitation that says there's a way through and a way out. It comes in Jesus Christ, it comes through forgiveness of sins, but the point is not merely to forgive sins, the point is to be reconnected to that living God who created you to begin with, in whose image you're made, and for whom you are designed to have a core relationship that everyone is designed to have, and life does not make sense without having that relationship with the living God. In him, verse 28 says, we live and move and have our being. For even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. You know another interesting thing Paul does in the midst of this speech? Nowhere do you say, in the book of Galatians it says, or in the book of Genesis it says, or in the book of Romans it says, or in the Psalms it says. He even cites their own sources for the theological points that he's going to be making as a way of drawing them into the conversation. I wonder if we could do that. 
If we know our literature and our culture well enough that in the midst of engaging with them, in the midst of talking with them, we could cite examples that portray theological truth, maybe even unawares in the things that are cited that come out of the culture. Could we do that? He begins to make the application in verse 29. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone or an image found in art or in the imagination of of man. He's going directly at the idols, but he's set it all up by the way he's gone about it. There is a more fundamental relationship than any idol you worship. And by the way, idols come in all kinds of forms. We can worship certain kinds of relationships. We can worship money. We can worship power. We can worship fame. Or we can worship God. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. He's setting up the discussion of Jesus. And in this he's given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out for the, he didn't even get to the end of the speech. When he got to resurrection, a discussion ensued. Some men joined him and believed, among whom were Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with him. And with that, our passage ends, Paul's address ends, and here's what he's shown us. Despite the fact that the culture is a mess, despite the fact that culture, the culture around us could be described in one very profound theological word, the word yuck. The offer of the gospel of Jesus Christ is for everyone. And because Christians have been included in that offer, they should with sensitivity and with respect offer that gospel to others who need what grace offers. Even though there's a battle that we are in the midst of, the gospel is about an invitation to join into real life. It's an important truth. I've grown up in an age in which the culture war has so dominated the way in which we engage that it's cut off our ability to engage with an invitation. And my plea to you as young people in the Lord is to not repeat our mistake. To so live with your neighbor in love, peace, compassion, sometimes confrontation, but confrontation with respect and confrontation that never forgets that what you're ultimately trying to do is to invite them some, into something that hopefully the Spirit will use to draw them, that your light will shine so brightly that heaven will sing a chorus of amens and say, well done, good and faithful servant of God. May we, as we engage the culture, not fight a war. May we, as we engage a culture, issue an invitation to life because the gospel is about more than merely forgiving sins. The reason sin can be forgiven is because of the life that's on the other end. I want to leave you with one picture. When someone comes to the Lord, they get baptized. I understand the roots of liberty are Baptist, so this is a good illustration. So we're going to be good Baptists. I want you to think about what the picture of salvation is, and I want you to think about it thinking about it Jewishly, for with me for a second. See, in Judaism, when someone was unclean or when someone had sin in their life, they couldn't worship at the temple. So they had to engage in a washing or a sacrifice in order to go to the temple. That was the point. And baptism, in one sense, is an extension of that picture. The picture is that your sins are washed clean, but why are your sins washed clean? So you can have life. So here's the picture. I hope you never forget this. 
Okay, this is, we're Baptists, so we're not sprinkling. This is a full tub of baptism we're going to engage in. Imagine if the gospel were only about forgiveness of sins, what that would do to the picture of baptism. So here you are, you're going into the baptistry, and you're going down. Only forgiving sin, so you're dead to sin. In Romans 6, in Romans 6, I told you you weren't going to forget this. In Romans 6, where baptism is discussed in the picture of baptism, water baptism is connected to spirit baptism, the picture is this. We are dead to sin, but that's half of it. What's the other half? What's the other half? Can I hear it? You're alive to God. The picture is you're washed, and because you're washed, when you come up, you're reconnected. Free to live and walk with the living God. That's the picture that we are talking about. We engage a culture not to shake a finger at them, not to do a knockout, not to shoot them out of the sky. We engage with God to reconnect God and man, much like those two fingers touched at the top of the Sistine Chapel that Michelangelo painted to bring us back to why we were created to begin with. May we, in our ministries, learn how to engage the culture with a kind of subversive respect, if I can say it that way, that keeps the invitation of the gospel primary, even as we challenge the things that are going on around us. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your goodness and your grace, for the richness of your salvation. We ask your blessing on our day. We ask your blessing on our lives and ministry, and we ask that we may learn from the Apostle Paul that in the end we share, not just because we care, but because you care, enough that you sent your Son, not just to die for our sins, as wonderful as that is, but to bring us back to yourself. Thank you for the love and hugs that you give us through Jesus Christ. May we share with the world how much God loves them too. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Real quick, let's give Dr. Bach thanks one more time for that message this morning.